apologize for being late to this hearing. I was at an Armed Services Committee hearing, and interestingly, there's a connection between the two. The Armed Services Committee was the NORTHCOM commander who deals with issues in North America and the Arctic, and the SOUTHCOM commander who deals with everything below Mexico. And the common thread is climate change. 75% uh, of the Arctic ice has melted in the last 40 years, and the, that's in terms of volume, and the Arctic is changing fundamentally as a uh, national security issue in terms of both Russia and China. In, in Central America, the testimony was that part of what's driving the crisis at our border is uh, the COVID impact in those countries, transnational criminal activity, which is gangs, which is just uh, out of control. And finally, two uh, major hurricanes that hit the region this fall, uh, and people just want to get out for a, a safer life, and they're headed for our border. So uh, here we are talking about uh, electric vehicles and alternative fuel vehicles, and it's all part of the same uh, issue. I think it's important that we realize that all these things are connected. I have to say, and I'm not going to mention the brand, I just bought a brand new car, which I rarely do, which uh, is one of the most amazing vehicles that I've ever encountered. It's a plug-in hybrid, and it can be plugged in, and you have 25 miles of uh, all-electric transportation for getting around town, but it also has a hybrid engine for longer distance. And coming in yesterday from Dulles Airport, uh, it averaged 61 miles per gallon on the hybrid engine. So this is, uh, I think, the future of transportation, a very efficient utilization of, of resources. I think, and I don't know if this has come up, but one of the benefits of alternative vehicle, uh, fuel vehicles, particularly electric vehicles, is a more efficient utilization of the grid. Our grid is designed, uh, it's like a church designed for Christmas and Easter. Uh, it has extra pews the rest of the year. Our grid is designed for the hottest day in August. And there's a lot of additional capacity on the grid uh, in the middle of the night in February or March or, or December or whenever. And this is when most people would be charging their vehicles. So there's an opportunity here for a much more efficient utilization of the grid. Uh, and of course, transportation, as I'm sure has been noted in this hearing, is about a third of our uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I'm interested in the in the alternatives other than electricity. We've had a lot of discussion about that. If one of the witnesses could sort of give me a 30 seconds on the status of of hydrogen, for example, as a feasible uh, transportation alternative, and and where where that stands and what the what the obstacles are at this point. Um, I can speak for Toyota. I think um, it is it's showing that it is feasible. We, as I mentioned, we have deployed over 6,500 Mirai, uh, our fuel cell four-door sedan in the state of California. There are 50 stations. We've had an immense amount of learning on, on doing this over the last five years, both from this infrastructure side, hydrogen production, as well as from the vehicle side. We're now on to our second generation fuel cell vehicle that improves uh, performance, fuel efficiency range, at a lower cost. So from our perspective, it is a, a technology that will grow. We're, we're selling it around the world in Japan as well as Europe. So we're also working on heavy-duty um, Class 8 tractor trailers to um, deliver uh, cargo in the LA area. So I, I think from our view, we see it as a, uh, you know, a, a fundamental technology that will grow going forward and help us achieve our climate goals. And the, the hydrogen can be produced by excess uh, capacity, uh, electrical capacity, can it not? Yes, that is one way to produce hydrogen. Hydrogen can be produced many different ways. So excess capacity, electrolyzers, renewable energy, as was mentioned earlier, from natural gas with, with carbon sequestration. So there's just a variety of ways to produce the hydrogen that really can vary by region. So whatever reg each region of the country has, they can use it to produce hydrogen. And the, and the emission from the, uh, uh, the burning of hydrogen is H2O. Is that, is that correct? 
Correct. We're not burning hydrogen. We're actually just uh, recombining it with, with oxygen to form water, and that's what comes out of the tailpipe. <laughs> well, I, I, I think water is, is a lot better than CO2, so uh, I, I appreciate that technology. And how many vehicles did you say you have deployed in California at this point? We've deployed over 6,500. And then if you add in our competitors' vehicles, it's around um, between 7,500 and 8,000 vehicles, I think. And at what point do you, are they, is, it, is this a cost competitive technology now or when will it be so? Well, we can't really talk about costs. Um, I, I think um, we can look at the price of the vehicle and, and see that it's, it's I, I think the current, the new generation is, is approximately 57,000 with three years of free hydrogen. So I think from the, the consumer standpoint, it's, it's a very attractive uh, price but I can't speak to cost at this time. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh